Good to go. Okay. Um, greetings, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning, wherever you're joining us from. Um, <laughs> I'm Kim Heffernan. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator in the College of Business. And um, this is our CBA Professional Development Summer Speaker Series. Um, this is our penultimate session. We only have one more after this. Um, it's been a really good go. We've had sessions weekly in June and July. So those of you who have come to multiple, we're, we're happy to have you back. Um, for those of you who are new, hopefully we'll see you again next week. Um, this has been a series of, you know, it's a time, it's a kind of physical time for everyone. So we thought, you know, instead of kind of taking a hiatus from our programming for the summer, that we would just lean into the current circumstances and offer some programming for our students to, you know, kind of get that professional development, still make connections over the summer with each other, and, you know, business professional partners. So that's kind of where we are um, and, and the purpose of this. So. Today we've got a really great speaker. His name is Jake Myers. Um, before I make the introduction, though, um, you know, hopefully you're all familiar with WebEx at this point. But um, you know, you can uh, if you just keep yourself on mute unless you're you have a question or want to talk. Um, that'll help us mitigate the background noise. Um, if you kind of hover over your screen on the top right hand side, you have different views. Um, so when Jake starts his presentation, you'll be there's a view where you can kind of have him and then his um, slides as well. Um, I encourage you to use the chat function, so I will monitor, keep, keep an eye on the chat function for questions. We want this to be an interactive session, so to that end, um, please, if you, uh, we'd love to see you um, because it is an interactive session, so we would love to have you turn on your webcams. Um, we won't judge you if you're in your pajamas, that's fine. <laughs> no one knows anyways. Um, so that we can see you all. So those are kind of some best practices there. So we're excited to have Jake Myers with us today. The title of the session is Become the Architect of Your New Normal, which could be more timely. Um, we're really excited to have Jake involved. Um, he's coming to us from Austin. So that's one of the benefits of the speaker series being virtual is we can have speakers come to us from out of state um, and we may not have ever considered that previously. So. Um, he is the president of sales um, for the Southwest region for a company called Local IQ, which is part of the USA Today network. Um, and is a really experienced speaker, lecturer, adjunct faculty member. I'm not sure if you're still doing that, Jake, now that you're not in Columbus for Ohio State, are you still? TBD, involved? TBD. I mean, they have to change my colors to burnt orange or uh, do oh, yeah. things, <laughs> which everyone's uh, becoming more accustomed to. So uh, those conversations continue. So to be determined. Yeah, perfect. Got it. Well, we're really lucky to have you here today. We're really excited. And with that, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to be quiet and let you do the talking. Sure. Thanks, Kim. Appreciate it. Um, yeah. So uh, in terms of uh, engagement here, uh, it, you know, just to, to echo Kim's sentiment there, um, if you are in a position where it is not 100% inappropriate for you to have your camera on, we all know what that uh, means, right? Uh, as if you play uh, video bingo here. We've all seen folks in, in the wrong environment to have their camera on. If you're not in an inappropriate environment, please uh, please flip your camera on. Um, I am one who, you know, to Kim's point, I've done a decent amount of public speaking. It doesn't mean I'm good at it. It just means that I've done a bunch of it. Uh, and I will tell you that the webinar environment is much more challenging. And also, uh, I prefer to be much more engaged with you all in this environment so that y'all aren't just checking email and, you know, reading up on whatever it is you're interested in. Uh, through this session. So I'm trying not to bore you to death. So uh, if you could please flip uh, flip the cameras on so we can kind of see each other. I'm gonna ask uh, for a little bit of engagement from y'all uh, from time to time. This is also when I would typically do, you know, mic check and make sure that uh, that everybody can hear me. Instead of that, we have different technical uh, things that we need to do. So I'm going to start my presentation, uh, or at least my deck here and share it, but I need to make sure that everybody has visibility and that I have, I will maintain some level of visibility with you all once I start sharing. So let's test the tech real quick. All right, uh, do we have a deck that's not in presentation mode yet? Is that what we're seeing? It's just coming up right now for me anyway. Okay. It just says it's starting, starting to share content. Did I overwhelm the system possibly? <laughs> is everyone else just kind of seeing it says Jake Myers is starting to share content? Okay, I see Ari. Okay, got it. What about my video? Like, can you see my webcam still? Yep. Yeah, we can still see you. I just, uh, the presentation is kind of dark and it just has that one. It just says 
is starting to share content, which yeah. usually happens when right before we can see your presentation. Oh, there we go. Perfect. We can see it. Now you're good. Yep, we're good to go. Okay. There was definitely some settings issues there. Okay. Now let me grab my Brady Bunch screen. Adjust that accordingly. Thanks for your patience. We're all adapting every day, right? All right. So I can get more folks on my Brady Bunch. Right now I only have four. I only get four. We got tiles, we got pages. All right, cool. I think we are good. So uh, I appreciate the, the introduction. Um, again, my name is Jake Myers. Uh, I am a former uh, Summit County boy. i born and raised in, uh, in Stowe, just up the road there from Akron. Uh, I'm currently now uh, in Austin, Texas, which is where I relocated for uh, this role uh, as the regional president for uh, Look Like You, which is um, under the Gannett umbrella, if you're familiar with Gannett, uh, owners of the USA Today uh, platform and network. So we have about uh, 300, 400 uh, different markets that we have, uh, we are content producers in, so owners of newspapers and radio stations, so forth and so on. So uh, I am in sales. So I head up uh, advertising sales teams across a seven state region down here uh, in the, what we call the Southwest. So it's Texas, Colorado, New Mexico, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma. Um, so very big geographic footprint. Um, so it's, uh, it'll be a lot of fun once we can travel again for me to get out uh, and see all these folks. Um, in terms of what we do, so uh, again, we're, we're in advertising, right? We're in media. Uh, and for me personally, it's very important that, um, that we stay focused as an organization, that all of us collectively, uh, you know, as professionals, that we stay focused on what's going on in our space. So we have uh, some partnerships with Google, which has allowed me some, some opportunities uh, to do things from, from a certification perspective, also from a, an engagement perspective. So I had the privilege of going to the 2016 uh, Olympics uh, down in Rio uh, as part of our Google partnership, which really was an opportunity to see what does our space look like at scale and also to have some fun in the process. So there were 70 other Google partners who were part of this, uh, this experience where um, you know, we were able to really dive in and, and get a better, uh, deeper understanding of what partnership looks like in 2016 and beyond, now in 2020, but also uh, where is the space going? And that, uh, of course, then uh, is consistent with a lot of the certifications and the continued education that they offer. I am an adjunct professor, adjunct lecturer at uh, The Ohio State University. Um, hopefully there's no uh, bad blood for anybody that's uh, that's on the call with us right now, but uh, I will be continuing in some capacity with them, even though I'm in Austin. Uh, and then also I'll start working with the uh, University of Texas at Austin, um, probably second half of next year. Um, I'm an instructor for the Columbus Bar Association and also for the Institute uh, for Leadership Advancement uh, with you all, with uh, the University of Akron. So I work uh, very closely uh, with Kevin Smith and now with Christina. Uh, Kim and I are working together as well, um, but I teach in the uh, in the continued education uh, program uh, for leadership with the Lyobi folks. So, the folks from, so. Um, also, don't hate me for this. I'm just throwing it all out there just in case y'all want to, wanna, yeah, exactly. Just in case y'all want to uh, come at me, right? Okay, I'm picking a fight. Uh, so I'm a, a proud graduate of Kent State University. And one of the things that I'll tell you, having moved from Summit County uh, to Tampa, Florida, where I was for five years, coming back and living in Columbus for six years, and now being down in Austin, is that, um, you know, whether it's, whether it's Kent State, whether it's the University of Akron, there is something about Ohio. Right. There's something about Ohio, whether it's whether it's uh, Ohio State, that everyone who is from Ohio has an incredible amount of pride for the fact that they're from Ohio. So despite the fact that we, you know, my alma mater is a, a direct rival of y'all, uh, the farther away I get from that geographically, I will tell you the more appreciation there is just for uh, the quality of education, the quality of folks uh, from the great state uh, of Ohio. So despite the fact that I'm in Texas and I've been in other places across the country, uh, where I've lived, uh, I will always be an Ohioan, uh, and I will always be a Summit County guy. So, um, But if I could wipe it all away, truthfully, and I guess I could on my LinkedIn profile, but take everything off my business card, take it off my LinkedIn profile, like, Jake, what are you about? Uh, I would say that I, I, I'm, what I'm really about is I'm a biology enthusiast, right? So those of you who are familiar with neuromarketing, there's a phenomenal program uh, and some really smart individuals there at the University of Akron who are into neuromarketing. I am in, I'm fascinated by how folks engage with media, engage with content, engage with their devices, and how they use that information for decision making. More importantly, how do we influence that decision making as folks who are in marketing, advertising, or really just as people, right? So what we know is that people are going onto platforms like the Facebooks of the world, social media in 2020, and they're consuming content. And that might be from authoritative sources. It might be from brothers, sisters, uncles, friends, cousins, person in a basement who has some strong 
thoughts and feelings about things. Folks are consuming content from other folks on digital platforms, and that is influencing decision making. And that fascinates me, right? It fascinates me how we can do it, how we can do it more effectively, and how we can do it in a way that is both um, altruistic, right? That's good for everyone, um, but also that helps folks align with brands like our partners uh, and our advertisers and our clients. So, if you can, again, if you wipe it all the way, that's what I'm about, right? I'm about consumer behavior. I'm about how people engage with their devices and use digital platforms to make decisions. Now, we all caught up? All right. Um, also, you know, I don't want to put in words in anybody's uh, mouths from the from the University of Akron staff, but to me, a huge part of the benefit of things like this is getting to know each other. That's why I spent some time there, right? We'll talk a little bit more about that in terms of uh, part of our context of our new normal. But, um, you know, if we want to get anywhere in this world, we've got to introduce ourselves to new folks. We've got to expand our horizons a little bit. So hopefully, um, you know, maybe you all uh, found out that somebody else is uh, in the same major as you or is uh, from the same hometown so forth and so on, and you have an opportunity to connect after this. I will say now, before I get to the end of the presentation, I am happy to connect with any of you at any given point in time. Um, you, you can grab me off of LinkedIn. I'll provide contact information. Anything that I can do to help, and here's why. I'm a big fan of um, it, you know, being the person that you didn't have when you were there. right? And I didn't have a lot of folks to reach out to when I was an undergrad and as I was coming out of undergrad and getting into my career. So more than happy to help anybody uh, however I can, whenever I can. And hopefully you all band together and help each other out on this journey. Last thing before we dive into core content here today is that I'm a big fan of selfies. All right? Uh, and not so much like, hey, I'm out here at the lake or whatever. Um, but I was challenged by a, a, a counterpart uh, who actually helps out with some stuff at the University of Akron uh, to get as many speaking selfies as humanly possible. And this environment is very, very different. So this is what it looks like in this environment. In a normal environment, I'd be in the classroom with y'all, right? And that's what it looks like when I do it in class. This is what it looks like when I do it on the screen. So I'm going to put on a super, a super cheesy smile. And you don't know if you're on my screen or not, so you don't know if you're going to get screen captured here. So I'd appreciate it if you do a super cheesy smile. And that's it. We're just going to take a quick selfie. All right. So on three. One, two, three. There it is. All right. We've got a virtual speaking selfie. Thank you. I uh, appreciate y'all being good sports. All right. How do we get here? I'm going to talk a little bit about my story because um, that's, uh, I think, relevant, but also kind of what I was asked to do. So I'm going to talk about my story and how we got here. And I'm going to talk about our story. And I'm going to talk about where we're going as a group. So my story in terms of my professional journey with a little bit of personal stuff uh, layered in here, whether it's relevant or not, I uh, started in uh, my quote unquote career at age 10 as a newspaper boy. Why is that relevant? Because it was for the Akron Beacon Journal. All right, so I'm getting up at 5 a.m. and I'm delivering papers to people's doorsteps and I'm arguing with them about whether it was supposed to go in the front door or the back door or where, where the newspaper was supposed to go. All right, so start off as a paper boy. We'll bring that around full circle in a minute here. Moved on, I'm 12 years old now. I'm still knocking on the same doors, except if, instead of uh, newspapers, I'm offering lawn mowing services, right? I was on the hustle, on the hustle at age 12. How can I make money without having to work for anybody? That's what I thought I wanted to do. Uh, moving into, you know, later into high school, 17, 18, I uh, start doing uh, construction, right? Subcontracting, me and a buddy of mine, I have a little subcontracting business, but at that point in our lives really just meant we were the grunts. Contractors would hire us and say, hey, this house just burnt down. We'd like to go dig through all the mess and throw it all away for us, right? That blossomed a little bit. It allowed me to put myself through, uh, through undergrad um, and learn some skills that I think have helped me out uh, down the road in addition to some calluses that I still can't get rid of. In college, uh, I was a business management and international relations double major with a minor in Spanish uh, and, and uh, South America was a focus for me. I was also in the Greek system. So I was uh, in a fraternity, I was treasurer, I was president at one point in time, risk reduction chair, which is a lot of fun for those of you who are Greek. Uh, risk reduction is a great job in something like a fraternity, um, but understood and got the exposure to how businesses work, and more importantly, how people are motivated to do certain things. I talked earlier on about I'm very, very into how people engage with devices and content to make decisions. This was a great experience for me in terms of how do you get people who are not being paid to do something to want to do it and to do it on time, right? So how do we work in organizations um, like nonprofits and others where folks are, are you know, uh, volunteering their time for something, but also if you're trying to achieve something within an organization, we have to get them to want to do it for us. So a very, very good experience for me. I moved on after undergrad and worked for Enterprise Rent-A-Car, right? Enterprise Rent-A-Car, where we give you the tools to own your own business, right? So I went through all their sales training uh, and business training programs um, and was there for about a year. And I, I found that the same thing that, that attracted me to enterprise was the same reason that, uh, that I ended up leaving, uh, moving down to Florida, which was um, I needed a lot of training. I need a lot of exposure to things at that point in time. So after those initial training sessions and after some initial experience, 
um, you know, I was, I felt kind of trapped. I was in a retail store with like two people and I was in a, in a strange part of town and I had an opportunity to head down to, uh, to Tampa, Florida, uh, where my now wife took a job as a sideline reporter. And I got into, um, what could be, uh, otherwise described as a shady business, <laughs> but it, our part of the business was not shady. Has anybody seen the movie war dogs? And you can do jazz hands if you've seen it. Uh, no, nobody's seen war dogs. All right, it's not that old. I thought maybe it might be a pop culture culture issue, but not that old of a movie. Either way, so War Dogs is a Jenna Hill movie from a few years ago um, that kind of describes what the industry was that I was in, which is basically government contracting. So I was in a brokerage firm, and if uh, I, uh, like a Boeing or a Lockheed Martin or one of our defense contractors needed parts that went into you know weapon weapons or uh, you know helicopters, aircraft, so forth and so on, they would call us, and then we would go find those parts for them. So we were brokering uh, different types of microchips, electronic components, things like that, uh, all over the world. Turns out uh, laws uh, evolve in that space as they absolutely should to keep you from doing shady things. And um, it, you know, there was, it was very, very aggressively regulated. So I was able to get some really, really great experience in global business. You know, my job there was basically to get in in the morning and to call into our Chinese uh, customers and suppliers because they're 12 hours apart from us, right? So as soon as I got in early in the morning, I'd talk to China and then I would wake, work, work my way through the time zones through Europe. I'd go to lunch. When I came back from lunch, I'd go into the Eastern time zone that I work my way through to the West coast. And then I would shut my day down. Uh, but a great, great opportunity to a get exposure to that type of global business and how the, the global uh, commerce works uh, from a small brokerage shop in Tampa, Florida. Um, but also after about 18, 24 months, I was there for four years, I completely ran out of gas, right? It was one of those scenarios where I wasn't learning anymore and it was just a matter of it's paying the bills, yada, yada, yada. So I was uh, recruited by a, actually a former fraternity member of mine um, to get into media, right? And the next thing you know, I'm in uh, you know, advertising and the media space and it is not nearly as cool, glamorous or uh, uh, alcohol infused as Mad Men might be, for those of you familiar with Mad Men, but uh, a great, great space where I feel like I've really found not just my passion, but my calling uh, when it comes to helping folks tell their stories, right? And a lot of that is helping, you know, individuals on my teams, but our core function is to help businesses tell their story, right? Tell their story through, you know, branded content, through advertising, but getting their unique message out to the people that they want to talk to, to influence that decision-making that folks, that the consumers have to make in order to identify which brands they want to align themselves with and partner with, right? So here's the deal. That's a little bit of my journey. Maybe you care, maybe you don't, but you got it anyways. Um, and so we can't have a conversation about journeys uh, in 2020 without talking about unprecedented times, right? I could have just flashed COVID up here. I could have flashed anything because we're all having the same variations of the same conversations right now. But here's the deal. I hate it. All right. I absolutely hate it. And this is why there's something about uh, this, these terms that we're putting around the COVID environment that is very victim focused, right? Like we're all dealing with the same challenges and it's remarkable the way that we've banded together. However, right now, our opportunity that's in front of us is 100% up to us to decide how we're going to capitalize on it or become the victims of the COVID environment. So I do not love talking about unprecedented times. Not in a negative way, at least, right? What I like talking about is unprecedented opportunity. There are businesses, as we know, who are absolutely flourishing through this time. There are individuals who are absolutely flourishing through this time. Some of them are opportunistic, right? Some of them are taking advantage of the situation. Others were prepared, right? When we look at, at, at video conferencing, right? Right now we're on a WebEx. Um, I, we use WebEx, uh, we use Teams, we use Zoom. If you looked at what, if you look at what Zoom did in the midst of COVID overnight, never lost a single inch of bandwidth and exploded overnight as we moved to this remote environment, had they not been prepared for unprecedented opportunity, they would not have been able to take on what they took on. Lots of video conferencing platforms crashed overnight and companies immediately abandoned them because it went from a luxury to a need in a matter of minutes and days. Right. So how can we take advantage of unprecedented opportunity in these times? I know it probably sounds a little strange to hear somebody say that, right? To say, hey, we're in the midst of COVID. For those of you who jumped on the call earlier, I recently moved from Columbus, Ohio, down to, to Austin, Texas, where we went in Texas and went from, hey, we'll go back to re, you know, reemergence into the marketplace to spikes everywhere. And now we're back in our homes. Right. So like the doom and gloom started, like started to see the sun through the gray a little bit and then went right back to gray. 
right? So how can we have these types of conversations when we know what's going on around us? And the reason that we can have those conversations is that at the end of the day, we are architects of our new normal, okay? What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is we have the opportunity to see where there is differentiation amongst our student counterparts, right? Other, other folks that are in our programs with us at our work, right? Where are folks floundering in this environment where we can flourish? I'll give you an example, and it's not to pat myself on the back at all. It's just a matter of having exposure and experience. When we flipped, so I went to California on a Thursday, right, in March. I went to California for a golf trip. When I left, we were in, don't worry about masks, but like wipe your seat down mode, right? So I wiped my seat down on, on the plane when I went to California. That was Thursday. On Sunday, all the restaurants in Ohio were closed. There was no more business. I literally landed, I have a four-year-old and a one and a half year old. I literally landed on Sunday and tried to get to a 24 hour Walmart that flipped from 24 hours to closing at 11 PM just to get the basic necessities. Because of course, as we know, everybody was taking all the toilet paper just to get the basic necessities because we had no idea what was coming. In the meantime, I was teaching a class in addition to my day job, I was teaching a class at Ohio State and we had to flip to Zoom overnight, like you all had to do uh, spring semester, right? We had to flip to Zoom. Many of my counterparts, many of our full-time professors, many of the adjuncts, they weren't ready for it. They absolutely weren't ready for it. They had to do things like record their sessions. They couldn't do a lot of engagement like this. They didn't know how to use breakout rooms and all that. That just happened to be something that we do as an organization all day, every day. So when we flipped to that remote environment, it was very natural for me. It was still less than desirable, right? I prefer a human interaction, but it was very natural. So who on the call can tell me what blue ocean strategy is? I'm fine with uncomfortable sentences. So I'll also call on you because now we know each other because I had to do an introduction. I did an introduction with basically best friends. So I'll wait until a hand goes up or I'll call. Jake, I would love to jump in, but I have no, I'll out myself. I have no clue what it is. Okay. All right. No guesses. All right. So did I not do, I didn't have the slide up. There you go. Anyways, I don't think that really helps or hurts, but anyways, blue ocean strategy. So blue ocean strategy, there's a book about it. There's a whole school of thought behind it. Um, I'm, sure, I'm surprised Kevin hasn't already jumped in to uh, give me the entire narrative around it. Cause I like to pull pieces out, but I know Kevin is a, uh, a dedicated to um, full learning, but blue, blue ocean strategy is essentially the thought process uh, behind it is we as individuals, we as organizations, we as leaders have a tendency to go where we see other sharks, right? We have a tendency to go to what they call red ocean, which is areas where lots of people are already hanging out. Lots of people are having a lot of success. Lots of people are doing a lot of things. And the problem with that is when we follow the sharks into red ocean, if we're a hungry shark and the ocean's already red, it means that the food's already been eaten, right? Does that make sense? So red ocean strategy is we follow the sharks towards the red water, but the problem is there isn't any fish left. Blue ocean strategy, on the other hand, is about finding the part of the ocean where there is fish, for lack of a better example, where there is opportunity because all of the sharks are over in the red ocean, right? So this is just a little bit of a breakdown of blue ocean, red ocean. I think this is an incredibly timely and appropriate type of strategy conversation to have with folks like yourselves, because as we look to succeed in, in, in crazy, uh, you know, unprecedented times, I'll use my own uh, hated term there, as we look to succeed in crazy and unprecedented times, it's important to identify what is everybody else doing? So back to my example about you know, webinars, had we not been in a place where we were using technology already, right? Digital transformation kind of already being part of our, our, our general cadence and our, our process, flipping to the virtual environment would have been incredibly painful. And we've seen businesses go completely under. We've seen people who have, like, on my sales teams, who don't have those types of skills, who are no longer able to engage with their clients, who are no longer able to do what their core job is, which is um, you know, partner with businesses to generate revenue and sell and make money doing it to put food on the table. So when we look at blue ocean strategy and red ocean strategy, what I want to encourage you all to do is to think about how that type of a concept might apply to the situation that you're in right now. Right. When we're looking at how are we successful at school, how are we successful at uh, business if we're in the in the workplace? What is everyone else doing that may or may not make sense, but that is oversaturating certain parts of the marketplace? Right. And how can we look for blue ocean? I'll give you an example. So if you read the book or if you if you study up on this, they talk about Cirque du Soleil. Right. Cirque du Soleil is essentially the circus without the major attractions, high paid actors or, or, or at talent acts um, without animals, uh, right? So it's very PETA friendly. However, they entertain more people per year. 
they charge higher ticket prices, right? And they have generally overall a higher quality experience and a better brand. Cirque du Soleil was born out of the circus industry, but they found that people were tired of the overpaid acts. People were tired of the animal abuse as that becomes more and more uh, well known and documented. People were tired of those things, but they still wanted to be entertained. So they they changed the venue. They paired it with some some more theatrical types of presentations, but it was still about great uh, you know uh, escapades of human. Uh, athleticism, right? So when we look at a Cirque du Soleil, we look at like a yellow tail wine, right? Yellow tail who went into a business that there's, you know, 80% of all, all of, of the entire marketplace in wine is dominated by eight individual wineries. And a company like Yellowtail came out and said, well, we're not going to go after the wine enthusiasts, right? We're going to make a wine, but we're not going after the wine enthusiasts. We're going to go after people who drink beer. We're going to go after people who drink other types of, of cocktails and other things. And we're going to get, we're going to provide them with a lifestyle and an experience with our wine that's a little bit sweeter, that's a little bit more uh, in line with what they're accustomed to. And we're going to pull them into the wine space, right? And overnight built a, a monstrosity of an organization. So this blue ocean strategy that says, hey, what is everyone else doing that doesn't necessarily make sense? Or it did make sense, but now that everyone's doing it, it's no longer differentiated. Where are our opportunities to succeed there? How do we do this? For starters, we live in a different world now, right? What got us here is not what's going to get us to the next level. I'll give you an example with our, with our sales reps. We have what we call KPIs or key performance indicators, which means here are the things that you need to do within a given week that we're going to measure to make sure that you're successful. Things like number of sales calls, number of uh, you know physical calls made versus number of meetings set, number of meetings held versus proposals, so forth and so on. If you do all of the right things, you're going to be successful. Now, all of those right things, the number of right things that you have to do in a non-COVID environment are very different than in a COVID environment, right? So some of our most successful sales reps right up until middle of March are no longer our most successful sales reps because they don't have the skill set and they haven't developed in a way that they can be adaptable to a situation and sell differently in a new environment, right? So what is that adaptability? How do we identify what got us here, right? And versus what's going to get us to the next level, right? If we're doing really well in school, but we have attention challenges, I've got attention challenges myself, right? Um, if we're doing really well in school, we have talent attention challenges, we flip, flip to a Zoom environment. How do we change the way that we engage and learn? We all have talked about it already in, in our opening conversation, right? Things that you like and don't like about webinars. And my question to you is this, ask yourself, what have you done to make it a more enjoyable or more valuable experience? Have you made the conscious effort, if you're on a webinar like this or others, to say, I'm not going to have any other windows open, period. Okay? I'm not going to have any other windows open, period, because I know everybody else on this call is going to have windows open, check their email, check social channels, check whatever they're checking. I'm going to choose not to do that. I'm going to say, I'm going to get everything out of this that I possibly can. It's not about this call. It's about the concept, right? Have we adapted and then said, how could we do it? I'm not a big like us versus them fan, but I am a very competitive dude. I'm, I'm I play a lot of sports growing up and I'm in sales where scoreboards are part of our daily routine. However, when we look at blue ocean strategy, when we look at being architects of our new normal, we have to bob when others weep, right? And so when we look at, you know, our opportunity to be very, very successful, we understand that there's other people who might be competing against. Maybe that's for test scores, maybe that's for jobs, uh, you know, uh, job applications and interviews, so forth and so on. What we have to understand is what got us here is not what's going to get us to the promised land. What got other folks here is not what's going to get them to the promised land. The person who figures that out first is the person who wins, the person who gets the better grades, the person who gets the job, because that is a very competitive space to be in right now, of course, interviewing for jobs because I'm on the unemployment uh, level, so forth and so on. We have to be masters of our craft. So who's going to figure it out first, right? Whoever figures that out first and adapts accordingly is who's going to get that reward that we seek. In addition to that, incredibly important as, we're, as we become architects of our new normal to become masters of our craft, to build our expertise to a level where no one can answer your questions. I'll tell you, again, I've been in a lot of different industries and I never mastered any of them, right? And it wasn't until I got into this space, and it only took about two years in this space, I'm being perfectly honest, which goes against the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hour rule, yada, yada, yada. However, it only took about two years in this space because of my level of interest and passion in the space to get to the point where I was working, am still working for a very large organization. And I was so passionate about things like Google search ads and Facebook ads and you know all of these emerging technologies for ad delivery that I couldn't find anybody internally to answer my questions anymore. And that was a massive launching point for me in my career. Once you can get to the point, and this is where a lot of people get frustrated instead of looking for the blue ocean here. 
once you can get to the point where your professor can't answer that question for you about that uh, about that industry that they're supposed to be teaching you about, about that subject matter they're supposed to be teaching you about, that is power, right? Once you get to a point where your boss can no longer ask you answer your questions about whatever it may be, right? Mechanical engineering or accounting or whatever the, the, your focus area is that I heard from some of the folks on the call. When your boss can no longer answer your questions, when your boss's boss can't answer your questions and they can't find a subject matter expert around you to answer your questions, you have created incredible value incredible incredible value however if all you do is keep it to yourself no one knows what that value is right so my my recommendation for you share your expertise everywhere that you possibly can right build your expertise be a master of your craft whatever that is that you're really into right now share it everywhere you can and then share it some more all right 2020 and beyond people want to align themselves with people who answer their questions and so if you are building your expertise to where people can't answer your questions or if you're building your expertise and getting answers to your questions from very very authoritative sources share the love share the wealth see what it does for your brand see what it does for opportunity that then starts to become inbound to you when you put those types of answers out there people start reaching out Right. People start reaching out and saying, hey, that's phenomenal that you posted that thing on LinkedIn, that you post that thing on social. That thought leadership is so incredibly valuable because people don't want to do that without being paid for it nowadays. And I'm here to tell you, I'll be the first one to tell any client, 90 percent of what I do is free consulting. It just so happens that the other 10 percent keeps the lights on. Right. I will give away 90 percent. I didn't do it 100 percent, but it just so happens that 90 percent is about what it averages out to. Is basically just me posting things and you won't see as much right now because I've been a little bit stagnant with all my relocation and all that stuff, but posting things is going on client meetings and saying, hey, we can do this for you, but honestly, I think you should just do it yourself. Here's I'll, I'll show you how to do it because the value we're going to provide just isn't quite there yet. Become a master of your craft, build your expertise to the point where, you, where no one can answer your questions, share that thought leadership everywhere. Here's the deal. Companies are dumb. People are smart. If you take the smartest, and we're a, we're a $5 billion, 14,000 employee company, if you took the smartest 10 people out of our company, we'd be in trouble. We'd be in trouble. The difference between the people who are self-educating and going next level right now and the folks who are on cruise control is a monstrosity of a gap, a massive, massive gap, right? Companies are dumb. And again, I'm an educator, so I'll just say this. Universities are dumb, okay? Not, not at scale, it's the people within the organization. It's the Kevins and Kims and Christina's and the rest of the, the staff, faculty and staff that are on this call right now that make the university what it is, right? You can be that agent of change. You can be that architect of a new normal, especially, not in spite of, especially in a pandemic environment because you are the master of your craft and because you have the answers. The first thing we do when something like this hits is we look around and we say, who's been through something like this before? Right. And if we're a master of our craft, we might not have been here before, but we can also say, hey, here's how I know we can get through this thing. Right. Um, so companies are dumb. People are smart. Last thing, uh, go where the fish are. Very, very important to go where the fish are. If you see sharks, you're going the wrong way. Right. Now, there's a little dichotomy in here, right, because uh, sometimes it might look like sharks and really what it is, is it's a wave. Right, esports is absolutely a wave right now. I don't know that we've got quite gotten to shark status with esports right now. So people who get in early with some things like that, that is a blue ocean. So it could be a little bit of a ride the wave, but that's a judgment call that you're going to have to make. Is when you see that a lot of folks are gravitating towards something, and differentiation is very very difficult. That may be a red ocean. However, if you find a niche in there, you may be able to find the blue ocean that's right next to that red ocean. Right? We have to be able to identify when people are all racing in one direction. Are we overly commoditized and is there a blue ocean niche or do we need to turn around and run the opposite direction and do the unpopular thing to differentiate ourselves? How do I do it? There's three things that are very, very important to me. And I'm not going to tell you that I do it well. I'm not going to tell you that I do it well. It is a daily, daily, daily journey. But my motto, my three things to live by, always learning, always applying, always teaching. This is something that I learned early on in my career, kind of as I was coming out of college, is that regardless of where I was in, in my career, how happy or unhappy I was with a given position um, or, or situation, is that if I was always learning, it was good. But if I wasn't applying or teaching, I was actually very, very frustrated and very, very unhappy, right? Because I was learning all of these things and I had nowhere to put it. And I wasn't retaining them because every day that goes by, you lose a little bit of that thing that you, that you got from that book that you read or that webinar that you jumped on, right? So we have to be learning. We have to find a laboratory. Find a laboratory to apply what you're learning, right? And then find a way to teach somebody else. The very first class that I taught at the Ohio State University, I'll share this with a very close group here, I had no idea what I was doing. 
none whatsoever. Had never built the content before, had never done anything like this before. I taught an eight hour Saturday class, eight hours on a Saturday, consecutive hours. I had to build the entire thing completely from scratch and I was completely scared out of my mind. And it was hands down one of the best experiences of my entire life. I was very uncomfortable, very, very uncomfortable, very not articulate, right? But I got through it. I got good feedback, both in terms of, hey, here's what we liked and what we didn't like. I tweaked. And here we are three, four years later. It's one of my favorite things to do in the world is educate and speak and have an opportunity to engage with folks like you. So always learning, always applying, always teaching. These are examples of things that, that, that I'm pulling from at any given point in time. So again, I'm in sales. I'm in sales leadership. I'm in people development. So it's very important to me to be looking at things like 10X, which talks about massive action. Take what you want, take what you think it takes to get there and do 10X what you think it's gonna to take to get that thing that you want and see if you fail. What are the odds that you fail if you do 10X what you think you're gonna to have to do in order to achieve something or to get something. Um, and then on through, uh, you know, just some thought leadership. So to me, uh, I do audiobooks as well because I'll fall asleep if, I, if I'm not, if I don't do audiobooks, but I sit down and read. Um, so big on audiobooks, big on self-education any way that I possibly can. But here's the deal, something that you all do not know about me that honestly I hadn't really even shared until uh, Kevin asked me to do a similar session like this back in the spring, but I think it's important for you all to hear. It is not all rainbows and unicorns, not all rainbows and unicorns, all right? I grew up with nothing. I had a very great, loving family, um, but the way that I grew up, there was, there was no money. All right. Like talking about a guy who had his, you know, our family had our gas turned off at one point in time, playing basketball in the in the driveway with a couple of buddies and a car gets repossessed by the bank. Um, we did not have money, had loving family, great roots, had no money whatsoever. To me, I didn't know where it would ever come from, had no idea how I'd ever create a life for myself where I didn't worry about paycheck to paycheck type of thinking. Um, as I told you before, I've had I've had some bouts, right? I've had some bouts of I don't want to call it depression because I don't think it's quite does the justice that it does for folks who, who battle with depression on an ongoing basis, but absolutely incredibly unhappy long periods of time in my, in my life, right? Especially early on in my career where I felt like there was more for me and I wasn't able to grasp it and I didn't know where to go, right? Very, very dark days, very, very, very dark days. But I'm proud to say that those dark days gave me the hunger, the desire and the appreciation for what could be achieved with a little bit of focus and with reaching out and just being very, very transparent with folks, being very vulnerable about where I am because the fact of the matter is people want to help. If you're willing to make yourself vulnerable, people want to help. And also I have narcolepsy, right? So I have a sleep disorder that essentially, that essentially means that it takes me about two times as long in a given night to get the amount of sleep that a normal person gets. Right. This is something that I that I noticed in my early 20s that I didn't actually get diagnosed until I was 30 years old. Um, but it was absolutely life changing for me to get that diagnosis because I knew something was up. Why am I always falling asleep? Now, this is not like um, like Deuce Bigelow falling asleep in soup at dinner. Right. That's uh, that's called cataplexy. It's a version of much narcolepsy. Mine is just about every hour and a half. My brain just wants to shut off. It says we didn't get enough sleep. We need more sleep. So about every hour and a half, despite the fact that I'll get eight to 10 hours, we didn't get enough sleep. I'm going to try and turn, turn off on you right now. OK, so it's not about rainbows and unicorns. And yeah, Jake, but you had the path paved for you. Absolutely did not have a path paved for you. I have some incredibly, incredibly valuable, sharp, articulate uh, uh, folks in my life who have helped at every step along the way. However, didn't didn't have a safety net of any spread stretch of imagination, did not know what I wanted to do uh, my entire life and just launch into what I wanted to do and just go into my career. I always wanted to be a doctor and I became a doctor. Great. Not at all. Right. Not at all. Uh, and have had some 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 challenges along the way. If I had more time, I'd tell you what my 2020 looked like. Uh, it's been a pretty wild ride. However, uh, we don't have time. And I am very, very excited about the future. Very, very excited about these two yahoos, right? So these are these are my two little ones, my four-year-old and my year and a half old. Um, very excited about this recent move that I told you about. Very, very excited for when this stuff opens up to get back and travel again. It's very important to me to get out and see things, to go across the pond when we can, expose ourselves to different cultures, expose ourselves to different folks, create empathy for all of those people around us um, and really understand what it is uh, to be a part of this awesome human race and have this complete human experience. A couple of things I do want to leave you with because again I'm looking at the clock here and I think we're out of time. For starters, smooth seas don't make skilled sailors. So as we become the mark the architects of our new normal, very important to realize that even if we didn't have pandemic, it's important for us to go through trials and tribulations in order to become skilled sailors, right? If we're gonna if we're gonna captain a ship and we've never seen anything but glass water, Something bad happens, we'll never be prepared for it. It's important that we go through this right now, but it's also important to understand that it is really easy to be great nowadays. 
because most people, and this is just my anecdotal uh, experience, but also according to David Goggins, who uh, has written some books and is a phenomenal uh, dude in terms of how to push yourself to new limits, most people accept their circumstances for what they are. However, if you make the choice to identify that what got us here is not going to get us to the promised land, to become a master of your craft and truly, truly, truly embrace a high level of expertise in, in that, those things that you are very, very passionate about and then share that with other folks, um, we're going to have a great, great opportunity to chase those blue oceans and not get caught up in the red oceans, right? Very tactical things that I think all of us could be doing right now with picking up that extra book, listening to that extra podcast, picking up all that information and getting on that path to where no one else can answer your questions. Now you've got a tremendous amount of value, especially in an unprecedented times scenario. So I'll leave you with that. Uh, Kim, I'll turn it back to you. Uh, but I guess, again, I know we're, we're two minutes over here, so we probably blew through Q&A, but I can hang out for a minute if, if we need to. Wow. That wow, I'm like energized now. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. That was awesome. Um, wow, yeah. If um, we did have um, a question from a student, but I, I you know, Jake had offered graciously to um, connect with you. So I encourage those of you who may have to connect with Jake, or you can send me an email and I'll connect the two of you um, if you have other questions. Um, wow, Jake, that was that was great. Um, thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, here for those of you so that uh, you can scan the QR code for those of you who may need credit. Well, we're going to thank you for those of you who may need credit for, for your class. Um, so thank you so much to those of you who attended. Um, this was a really great session. You, you picked a good one to come to. Um, we've got our last session next week. It's a virtual interviewing workshop. It'll be a good way to wrap up this series. It's with Natasha Kima from um, the Jam Smucker Company. Um, so thank you so much for coming. I hope you'll come back next week. Jake, just can't thank you enough. Um, you know, it's cliche to say these sessions aren't possible without you, but wow, um, you just gave us a lot to think about. So thank you so, so much. Um, I really appreciate it. Happy to do it. <laughs> All right. Um, and with that, we will, we will close the session. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, y'all.